Welcome everyone to this, the second session of readings by graduating students of the University of King's College Masters in Creative Nonfiction program. Our readings tonight, or today I suppose, depending on where you are, are part of something called Creative Campuses, which is a collaborative initiative by Nova Scotia's universities and community colleges to highlight the variety of creative work that's being done here. My name is Stephen Kimber, and I'm lucky enough to be the cohort director for the class of 2021. I'm speaking today from my basement home office in Halifax, that is in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. We are all treaty people. We encourage you to find out more about the Indigenous lands uh, you may live and work on. A good resource for that is called native-land.ca. Tonight's readers, who are physically scattered across this land from coast to coast, are in the final days of what has been a roller coaster ride. Thanks to COVID, they've gone from what was supposed to be a two year limited residency program to a completely virtual one. Despite those challenges, they've adapted and produced excellent work. Tonight's readings are from their books in progress on topics as diverse as a year in the life of a pair of mute swans living and raising a family in Toronto's Asbridges Bay to an expose of a 20 year campaign to suppress the truth about the safety of a drug being tested on children to a memoir that combines an introduction to Greek mythology with trans non-binary memoir. When you hear about their books in the months and years to come, you'll be able to say you hear the, heard them here first. So on with the readings. Our first reader is Suzanne Hartman. Suzanne is a Toronto-based editor, writer, and children's book author. Compelled by an aging family of Second War, World War internment survivors, Suzanne began documenting family stories to preserve cultural memories. The nail that sticks out gets hammered in is a next generation story exploring Toronto's post-war Japanese Canadian community through memories of significant places, events, and traditions. This hybrid of memoir and history written by a biracial fourth generation Japanese Canadian bridges two cultures. It contrasts the North American dream of achievement through the lens of conformity imposed by the Japanese adage, the nail that sticks out gets hammered in. Suzanne. Thank you and good evening fellow students, faculty, mentors and guests. I'd like to thank you Stephen and Kim for organizing these final readings and giving me this wonderful opportunity. The excerpt I'm about to read is from a chapter titled Miss Tokyo. For people like my grandparents, the old ways mattered. There were rules to be followed, status quo maintained, and strict hierarchies of rank and position. My ancestors knew their place and what was expected of them. Every generation feels compelled by responsibility to pass on their legacy in some way, this pride, duty, and accountability. As a young woman, I resisted their lessons and rejected the notion I should carry on as they did. After all, to be a Japanese woman in the patriarchy placed you at the bottom of the tier, and a biracial woman much lower than that. For years I tried to discard these teachings only to realize much later how much a part of me they actually were. Growing up our days were infused with duality, my Japanese heritage a double-edged sword, a centuries-long rich history full of both honor and inequity cloaked in cultural traditions. As much as I love my family, instead of transforming into a graceful swan, I grew into an angry young woman once I realized I was a second-class citizen, my own achievements diminished by those whom I held most dear. Regardless of any effort, whatever my accomplishments, because of my gender, I was not the one who mattered. Only the men counted. I'd always prided myself on being the first grandchild to graduate from university. Until that time, Grandma proudly boasted that Brian was the first to graduate. Don't you remember, Grandma? I was the first, I began. Annoyed, she brushed aside my interruption and continued. Yes, he was the first grandson. Her words cut me to the core. 
Like succession lines in Japan, the highest status in many families is granted to the firstborn male, never mind how many women came before or after. For the men in my family, their goals are considered more worthwhile, accomplishments worthier, and their pursuits of much greater importance. That's just the way things were, and to some degree, still are. My sister Dee recently confided to me, growing up, I never felt like I mattered to anyone. You mattered to us, I said. When my grandfather was alive, as the head of the household, he always sat at the head of the table. No one ever considered sitting in his chair, his spot. Starting with him, the men were always served first. The male relatives, including the non-Japanese husbands and friends, flocked to the choice seats flanking grandpa to enjoy this preferential treatment as honored guests. Behind this show of deference, another power structure lay, the rigid rule of women. The true heart of any home is always the kitchen, and for us girls, conscription to the kitchen began at an early age. Pressed into service like the generation of women who came before, we must toil and serve to fulfill our duty of our, our lifetime of duty. Roll the sushi, present the food, pour the tea, wash the dishes. Unlike my male cousins, depending on my skill, status, and aptitude, I'm expected to run through the trenches from kitchen prep to head cook, to be assigned to event planning and hostess duties, entrusted to do the shopping or relegated to the cleaning crew. Somehow domestic servitude came to represent family loyalty. This idea was imposed on us and determined our worth above other contributions. Compelled by love and respect, I continue to help of my own volition. In my mind, loyalty means putting other needs, others needs ahead of my own, acting out of love, not from an embittered position of malice or the false face of martyr duty, a show of effort only for the sake of appearances. There were enough women doing just that. The older women in my family and the Japanese Canadian community at large may have accepted their roles with honor and grace. For others like myself, this lack of freedom and autonomy will never sit straight. Even if we shared the pain and experience of being considered second rate in our own homes, instead of supporting one another or banding together, as women and girls, we often worked against each other. Pity any Asian woman who fails on the home front, for it is here in the household where women are judged. Not by the men, but by the other women. Thank you. Back to you, Stephen. Thank you very much. Uh, that was powerful. Thank you. Uh, Brady Patterson is a lyric essayist living in Halifax, Nova Scotia, with their partner and two cats. Brady uses her background in philosophy to examine ancient, modern, and postmodern stories told about human nature and to contribute to the possibility and necessity of weaving new narratives out of the vast material of the past. Currently, they are working on their manuscript, Palimpsest. Ancient and Modern Identities, which is part introduction to Greek mythology and part trans non-binary memoir. Though yet to be published, her essay, Stay Sis, was shortlisted for the 2020 Malahat Review Open Season Contest. Brady. Sorry, I already had my window up, so I was getting ready to read, and then I realized I did not unmute myself. So here I go. So this is an excerpt from an essay on Medusa. I kind of, this is kind of like the radio edit version so that I could speak to you all tonight. So this is uh, navigating trauma through apotropane and therapeia. Sometimes she smiles. Sometimes she sticks out her tongue. Sometimes tusks protrude from her lips, lips which are sometimes adorned with a beard. Her hands may be bronze and her head is often disembodied. Wings sprout from her shoulders, often entwining adders writhe from her head, but always, always she confronts you. Whereas so many other figures stand in profile, she faces directly toward you with eyes that could swallow you whole. She forces you to shiver out the caries, evil little spirits which cause madness, sickness, and decay. She is Medusa, and before else, she is your guardian just as her name tells us. Medusa is one of the most engaging and potent images, both of modern and ancient imagination. 
Her image was frequently placed on pottery, in burial chambers, temple friezes, altars, coins, and thresholds. Even saying her name today, you can conjure up her image, at least the snake hair motif. She's also one of the oldest images in Greek literature. So who is Medusa and where does she come from? She comes into Greek consciousness during a time of diaspora and migration throughout the Aegean. She bears an incredible likeness to the Hindu goddess Kali, who is also depicted with a protruding tongue, sharp teeth, and snakes surrounding her head. Hesiod, one of our oldest glimpses into Greek religion, places Medusa in Libya. As for her family, Hesiod tells us that she is one of three Gorgons, Gorgon, dreadful, terrible, terrifying. And from these details, we can see that Medusa's identity is essentially tied to being fearsome, foreign, and othered. But if Medusa is from another civilization, or multiple, how did she come to dominate mythological narratives on Greek pottery, perch herself atop temples, guard tombs, or stare at you from the bottom of a kylix, a wide-mouthed terracotta wine cup? It's because she was a powerful apotropaic symbol. This word comes from the Greek apotropane, which means to turn away evil influence. She dispels fearful things by being something fearful. When mythology finally accompanies the rich and ancient visual history, it is told by Ovid late in 8 AD. In his account, she experiences a trauma, trauma, wound. Now wounds need two things. They need protection and they need healing. For protection, we can refer back to her apotropaic origins. How does she protect herself? She is aversive, fearsome, and her gaze renders you powerless. Apotropane, in ancient as well as modern times, is an extremely effective way to protect yourself from further trauma. However, it is too effective. It is true that if you push everyone away, you will never be hurt, but it's also very isolating. Especially so because the ones most likely to harm us are not strangers or gods, but those who we love most. Love puts us in a unique position to be completely undone. It is not possible both to be apotropaic and to love. There is another Greek word related to apotropane, which serves as another way of navigating trauma, therapeia, where we get our word therapy. This word gets translated in a variety of ways. However, there are two I wish to speak of tonight. The first is fostering good influence, and the second is attendance to the body. While apotropane utilizes an averse outward gaze to push away evil influence, therapeia utilizes a careful inward gaze toward one's health. The former pushes away while the latter invites in. The former offers protection, the latter healing. It is not that one is better than the other. Both are integral to the healing of trauma. A wound must first be protected before it can heal, and healing is the ultimate goal. We are too often told traumatized people are damaged and they're broken. And it is a narrative ultimately, which is disempowering. Trauma may mean wounds, but even wounds that scar have so much to teach us. If we emphasize the damage received, we neglect the power and capacity each of us have for healing and learning. At this moment, I'm still trying to find a way that I can practice therapy in my own life. I have been wounded by people, wounded by forces I cannot control, but slowly I'm learning that I can only bury my tests for so long. I found friends, good friends, who see me not for what has been done to me or for the shape my body comes in, but for who I am as a whole, as a soul. Friends who help foster the good in me that I wish to put out into the world. I've begun to trust in myself and in others through attending to my body. In doing so, I've realized there is no narrative written into my flesh, that I am both soul, adaptable, and versatile. It is delving into the history of Medusa's varied stories that taught me the tools necessary for me to live with my trauma. It's in telling her history that I hope you may live with yours. Thanks, that's the that's the radio edit version. Thank you, Brady. That's uh, provocative and always new ways of looking at the world. Thank you very much. Gloria Blizzard is a nonfiction writer, poet, and penner of songs whose wordsmithing has appeared in literary publications, magazines, and sound recordings. Her essays, reviews, and poetry have been published by cbc.ca, The Globe and Mail, This Magazine, Held, Dance International, and The Conversation, with upcoming publication in the Humber Literary Review. You can follow Gloria on Instagram, at Gloria Writes, or on Twitter, at Gloria Blizzard. Gloria. 
you're on. You have to unmute yourself there. <laughs> oh, that would be important. Okay, so the essay I'm about to read is from my collection. And this has just been published in this magazine uh, this, this spring. Art as Medicine, How Samba Saved Me. Quarter inch wide strips of elastic sewn onto soft pink fabric by our mothers held our ballet slippers onto our feet. We, the other girl children of the professional class of the island of Trinidad and I wore flesh toned tights on our little brown legs. My parents spoke of dancers Beryl McBurney and Jeffrey Holder. They openly admired writers like C.L.R. James and Derek Walcott. I don't think, however, that my parents, a doctor and a nurse, expected me to take their messages about the importance of such things quite so seriously. The result of which was that I would go on to become a poet with a propensity for dancing. At university, I studied science. However, as I fumbled through the years of formulas and equations, I danced with two university groups, Caribbean Cayenne and the Ballet Club. I still held those plies in my legs and fingertips. Any hopes that my parents might have had of me going on to medical school were dashed when I got a job in a lab between classes. When one of my duties became cleaning up radioactive isotopes spilled by sloppy fourth year students, I then had the last bit of information to add to my arsenals of reasons to quit. I did not enter a dance studio again, however, until decades later. When I did, it was with a sense of urgency. I'd been a part of Escola de Samba, a Toronto percussion ensemble that played music from Brazil. I played tambourine, a very small drum on which you play complex rhythms at high speeds with a nylon stick. After years of this, my hands hurt. I was also disoriented, post-divorce, frightened, and worn out by the relentless search for emotional safety and material survival. The band would often perform with samba dancers. They looked fabulous in feathers, eyelash extensions, glitter, and heels. They moved powerfully and sensually through space. I need some of that, I thought. I laid down my drumstick and went looking for a dance class. Samba Fundamentals was taught by an Italian-Canadian woman who studied herself out of ballet and into considerable expertise in Afro-Brazilian dance. Women in the North cannot move their hips, she said. I'm from the Caribbean. I got this, I thought. Yet I looked in the mirror and saw stiffness as I moved my own ample hips side to side. Ballet had not prepared me well. I did not have it. The instructor told us that we were all beauties, that we were goddesses. She said that our bodies were luscious and glorious. Your hips are to be shaken. If the flesh on your thighs is not jiggling, it's not samba, she yelled. I learned about the origins of samba in the Afro-Brazilian religion of Candomblé. When I danced the Orisha Imanja, I became the goddess of the sea, mother, protector, fluid and sensual with the infinite power of the way. As Oshun, I was coquette yet wise. When I danced Shango, the god of thunder, lightning, fire, and justice, I threw bolts of lightning at the sky. I was fiery, direct, and clear in my intentions. I was Osai, the medicine man who drank too much. I stumbled around and yet made brilliant medicines out of plants from the forest. In these movements, we explored how to be one thing and yet another, fierce and generous, resilient and wild, to hold a multitude of selves. The movement vocabulary started to inform how I lived. When needed, I could swagger with the embodied armor of Ogun, the warrior, protecting myself or my daughter through times of fear, bewilderment, or dismay. Through dance, my joints and muscles became supple. I learned to move courageously, joyously, taking up space in my worlds. 
I was re-energized, rediscovering resilience, balance, sensuality, and joy. I never did put on the feathers and heels, but I learned to move through the world as if I was powerfully, playfully, sensually wearing them. Great. Great. Thank you very much. That was wonderful, a wonderful performance of, of, of your, your reading as well. I did say earlier that, that uh, we are a very diverse uh, lot in terms of subject matter, and we are. Uh, our next reader is uh, Dr. Nancy Oliveri. Uh, she was the youngish, as she puts it, professor of pediatrics and medicine at the University of Toronto and a researcher of blood diseases at Sick Kids Hospital when she became the target of powerful enemies. She'd raised concerns about the safety of a drug being tested in children. Her book details a 25-year war against Canada's billionaire pharma czar, Barry Sherman, and against the academic institutions which sided with Sherman. The campaign to suppress truth and crush Dr. Oliveri, including through repeated uh, attempted dismissals and lawsuits, takes us from Asia to the European Courts of Justice back to Toronto, where in 2021, many questions are still unanswered about the ongoing threats to patients' lives. Nancy. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, I just want to thank you and Kim and everybody else at King's for this opportunity <clears throat> for a wonderful two years of learning and great times. I'm really sad. I've loved it. I'll miss all of you a lot. And this excerpt is set in 2009, 14 years after the original events in 95, which set this controversy in motion, which is just another way of saying this story is never going to end. But it's for anyone who thinks that pharma, big pharma, is the only force standing in the way of truth and research. Some names have been changed to protect the guilty. I changed one name to Doug in honor of our fearless leader in Ontario. March 2009, a freezing day in Toronto. Corporate Toronto General Hospital thinks you're trouble. Pause. You're fired. Now the temperature has dropped even lower inside the large office of my chief of division, medical oncology and hematology at Toronto General Hospital, where I worked or thought I had worked until that moment. The division chief, Doug, has called me into his huge corner office for a little off the record chat. Unlike mine, Doug's office is neat, almost painfully unadorned of any evidence of ongoing work. But it would be a mistake to believe that Doug has not been busy. He's been very busy taking orders from corporate Toronto General Hospital, whatever that is. Doug is gawky, affable, and I've always thought a bit dim. He's also very well liked. He reminds me of the guy in Body Heat to whom Kathleen Turner remarks, you're not that smart, are you? I like that in a man. The Toronto General Hospital really liked Doug. In our little off the record chat, Doug has come to the point pretty quickly. Having delivered the news of my firing, he settles in his chair now relaxed. He also appears relieved that I'm not hysterical. In fact, there are two reasons that I'm not hysterical. First, this is far from being the first time I've been fired by someone just like Doug. And second, at that moment at least, I am so overcome with genuine amazement that anyone whose job it is to fire someone would do so so clumsily. I mean, can't they hire smooth axemen for these jobs? At least invent a decent excuse when you are firing someone. The administrators at Sick Kids Hospital were so much better at firing people. I lean in, Doug. You've actually told me you're firing me because corporate players at Toronto General, the pharmaceutical industry, thinks I'm trouble, right? He stares at me, now silent. I continue. Don't you realize that I'm now going back to my office to write you an official letter, which will be made public, confirming you told me this is why I'm being fired. Do you have any idea of how much trouble is coming? He doesn't, of course. Doug, as the above indicates, is a novice. But I'm not. Over the 15 years before Doug's, firings were my way of life. At SickKids Hospital, I was fired by administrators whose life's ambition, just like Doug's, was to be division chief at a Toronto teaching hospital. A division chief's standing orders aren't too complicated. You're pretty much charged with carrying out, without protest, the demands of the hospital's hierarchies. Being a division chief is considered very prestigious. Of course, if these jobs didn't suck, they wouldn't have to make them prestigious. This firing, like all those past, has its roots in my conflict with the drug company, with in particular billionaire Barry Sherman, the CEO of the drug company Apotex, whose presence might seem far removed from Doug's unembellished corner office in the largest research institute in the country. But it's not. The original conflict, which began almost 15 years before, had arisen over interpretation of data arising from clinical trials of a drug, deferiprone. Barry Sherman considered deferiprone his baby. That was true even though 20 years before my chat with Doug, 
It had been I who'd read about deferropone in the British Medical Journal, convinced my colleague in the university to synthesize it in his lab, designed two clinical trials to evaluate the drug, obtained government funding for the trials in which I then personally enrolled all the patients, my patients, at SickKids Hospital and Toronto General. But then, as it always does, comes down to money. Clinical trials are expensive. I needed more support to add to the public funds I'd been receiving to test a ferroprone, and I unwisely agreed to approach Sherman, infamously described as the only person in the entire world with no redeeming qualities whatsoever. My clinical trials were high stakes. Contrary to uninformed public understanding, Sherman stood to gain a lot if, if deferiprone could be shown to be effective and safe. No patient is cured by deferiprone. Patients take it daily and forever, and there were thousands of such individuals worldwide, which would, of course, pay off handsomely for any drug company successful in retaining the patent rights. But when, as it happened, my studies ultimately revealed deferiprone was insufficiently safe, Sherman threatened all legal remedies should I report those findings and abruptly and prematurely shut the trials down, preventing generation of future data. More frightening had been the responses of the U of T and SickKids. Administrators at both places, in undisclosed negotiations for the largest donations in the university's history from Sherman, joined Sherman in years of intimidation, bullying, and false testimony about me to public agencies and the courts. There were secret star chambers, confrontations in the courts of Europe and Canada, and attacks in the press, including an astonishing interview on 60 Minutes. You could not make any of it up. And indeed, John Le Carre in his book and movie, The Constant Gardener, which was inspired by my story, observed, I came to realize that, compared with reality, my story is as tame as a holiday postcard. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we look forward to your book and the movie of the book that you write as well. And then the book about the movie and stuff like that, too. Yeah, that'll, that'll work. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, our next reader is Selena Coombs Sands. Uh, she's the product of an immigrant mother and a Canadian father, born and raised in British Columbia with close ties to her Mexican roots. She has spent her lifetime trying to reconcile the two. She returned to post-secondary education later in life, where she discovered a love of writing. She has a BA in creative writing from Kwantlen Polytechnic University and an MFA in nonfiction from the University of King's College, very soon to be awarded. She lives in the suburbs of Delta with her husband, Eric. This is her first book. Selena. Thank you. I got that uh, mute off. So I'm reading uh, from my book, Surviving Magdalena, and I am reading uh, from the final chapter, just an excerpt. It's uh, called um, Homest Homestretch Heroes, Chapter 13. Despite the years she has resided at Buena Vista, my mother is still meek, behaving more like a cautious guest than a comfortable resident, always perfectly mannered and cautious in her questions taken aback by the overbearing behavior and familiarity her housemates use with her or the staff. She's never forgotten the lessons of good manners taught to her by her mother, my mama Nina. She never lets me forget them. Que te cuesta? Good manners cost nothing. A familiar saying we heard as children. Por favor, gracias. Please and thank you. Spanish or English, the language of no consequence. When I reach in front of someone in a store, I never forget to say excuse me. I cringe when it's not reciprocal. Oh, uh, the washing machine isn't finished yet. I can hear the quiver in my mother's voice. She's been inside for about a minute. Don't worry, Magdalena. It's the soothing voice of a staff member in the kitchen. I'll put your clothes in the dryer. Go outside and enjoy your visit with your daughter. Thank you. That simple kindness has removed the burden that weighed on my mother. The staff adores her and they treat her with genuine tenderness. I hear the door push open and my mother rejoins me outside. She clasps her hands under her chest and wears a look of concern on a face that's turning into my mama Nina's. I smile encouragement with a face that's morphing into hers. In the two years since I stopped dyeing my greys, I feel like I'm on the express to catching her up to her in that department. My mother's never had a thick head of hair one would expect of her Mexican heritage and has passed that on to me. With age, hers has gone from fine to thinning. Whenever I give her short, more salt than pepper hair a trim, she comments on it worriedly. Me estoy quedando calva. No está tan mal. I tell her, it's not so bad. You're not going bald. We both have soft but lined skin. She's a little more jowly, but someday I will be too. 
We both favor no makeup on our olive skin. If we were heading out, she might powder her nose and put on lipstick. She can expertly apply a coat of Brevlon's wine with everything without a mirror. Even though I tower over her, the sun's hook on my nose it makes it easy to claim shared DNA. From our vantage point, back out on the bench, we watch giant striped bumblebees visit baskets of flowers that hang in abundance from the house and office. She's visibly relieved. She relaxes, knowing someone else is listening for her laundry load to announce its completion. We try to identify the colorful birds that flit about the front garden. Less than amateur ornithologists, neither of us has any success beyond robins and seagulls. Pajarito, gaviota. She looks up at the noisy flock that's gathered overhead. This close to the ocean, there are plenty. I work on pulling the Spanish names for these birds from my brain. I worry I'll begin to forget this language, the very one gifted to me by this same woman, the words I knew even before English. Our conversation is an easy one. A word here, a comment there, no need to fill the pockets of silence. I pull the sweater she's brought me from her room a little tighter around my shoulders, thinking, thanking her for its warmth. She looks tidy and comfortable, having donned a knit vest over the long sleeve t-shirt and denim pants. I have lots of questions about the past, but my mother's begun to lose memories due to her ECT treatments, and it frustrates her. I let her lead and help her if she fills in the, if, to fill in the blanks. She asks if she's been a patient at the hospital in Surrey, and I tell her yes. I don't expand. She doesn't need to know. She spent several stints there, the first one dating back to 1977. She asks why she was there, and I tell her she wasn't mentally well. She asks who took her there, and I tell her Joyce and Victor. She's content with my responses. After a moment, she tells me when she wakes up in the morning, it's hard for her. She feels like she's dying. I've heard her say this more times than I can count. I've begun to see the statement as her attempt to articulate the despair she experiences. How does anyone find the words for darkness? Our connection grows. Then knowing how much of her life she's actually been mentally unwell, she tells me she fears that she didn't do right by me and my sisters. I tell her it wasn't her fault. I tell her we're all doing the best we can. And for once, I mean it. Sitting on that bench, I realize the resentment against her that I've carried so much of my life is lifting. Not in some dramatic fashion, it's just peeling away in layers, the way it was added over the years. Layers of bark, rings in a severed tree trunk, permanent and natural. We are mother and daughter. I drift back to the day I had to take her to receive her monthly maintenance ECT treatment, the electric shock therapy she dreads. It was a first for me. I went through the process alongside her, start to finish, and bore witness. I became painfully aware how all my previous, don't worry, you'll be fine, and there, there is, sent down the phone line would sound hollow and insulting. Like putting a Band-Aid on a gaping wound and expecting to stem the blood flow. Insincere and limp words, words she grabbed and clung to. I saw firsthand the terror in her eyes. I saw the physical evidence of her fear manifested in the machine monitoring her blood pressure as it climbed to dangerous levels in the moments before the seizure inducing electric shock was administered. I watched her agitated body writhing around a hospital bed. Even with two nurses and myself attending to her, we were unable to calm her down and she still hit her head on the bars meant to keep her from falling. She went on to pull her leads and wires out in a desperate attempt to speak. She pawed at me. She looked through me to some horror beyond. She uttered unintelligible words that made their way back to speech. I sat with her. Later, I helped her back into her street clothes. Dazed, dependent, and vulnerable, she clung to my arm as I supported her back to Buena Vista Lodge and the safety of her bed. I was certain she'd have no recollection I'd ever been there. The next afternoon, my phone rang. The caller ID revealed it was Buena Vista's number. Hello? Selena? Si, sí, mama, como estas? It was my mother. What could be wrong? She rarely called me. ECT treatment is almost a guaranteed two days in bed to recover. No mas quería ver como sigas. She had pulled herself out of bed, made her way to the shared phone in the tiny space off the living room to call to see how I was. Through the haze of her ECT treatment the day before, she remembered that I had taken her. I could not have loved her more. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking us inside that relationship. 
Danny Benson has spent her adulthood rebelling against the traditional values she was raised with and exploring the world on her own terms. She is currently isolated in the mountains of BC, spending her pandemic days debating feminism with her Tinder matches, developing a codependent relationship with her pet fish, and documenting her life's past misadventures. Danny. Unmute. Ah, uh, okay, we're here. Um, <laughs> uh, a little hard to go after clean on that, but here we go. Don't get too drunk on a first date. Don't talk too much about being from Toronto. They don't like that here. Don't tell them why you moved here because that's talking about your ex. Don't tell them you're back in school. In fact, don't tell them you got a post-secondary education if they didn't. Don't talk of anything of too much importance about too many opinions, regardless of how well-researched your side of the debate may be. Definitely don't tell them you're a feminist. Don't be argumentative, don't be too compliant, and whatever you do, do not have sex, especially unprotected. It was just over 60 days of not having been touched by another person when I decided to have my first COVID almost friendly date. We met in a park between our buildings. We each brought a bottle of wine and sat at a CDC, Dr. Bonnie Henry approved distance in the fresh open air. The evening went decently well. I've been around the online dating era long enough to know that high expectations are not welcome on first meets. If you don't do anything blatantly offensive and we vibe, you get a second date. If I wanna jump your bones, bonus. With the bar of seeing them again set so low, you can imagine my surprise when after two hours of lovely conversation, he stated that I will not be his future wife. Um, okay, we just met, so I wouldn't exactly expect you to know right away, but go on. Well, I thought he was intuitive enough, intuitive enough to know that he should not go on, especially with what came next. I heard him out. I think you're smart. I think you're funny. I find you super sexy but it wouldn't go further than that. I want a girl I can bring home to mom. One that has a more nurturing career, like a nurse or a teacher. And my type is blonde and smaller. I tried to contain my shock. Coming in at a whopping 5'2", he wasn't referring to my height, but rather my size six frame. And let me tell you, the gentleman in front of me wasn't exactly Mr. Pitt Perfect himself. With his unflattering corn stash and not so teeny corn belly, he was barely one to be ordering up pizza to up toppings on his women as he does a slice of pizza. I'm not sure how long he was waiting for my response while my mind played through a montage of options. Option one. Ah, I see the time machine that brought him here. Makes sense. It was 2020. It wouldn't have been the weirdest thing to come out of the year. Option two. I begin shrinking my accomplishments and goals for the future because that's what we're trained to do. Be what they want us to be. Option three, I get defensive and pit myself against the women of his past and potential future. Oh yeah, you're single. So how exactly is it finding that for yourself? Have you discussed this with your therapist? Don't you think that there's a reason you have found your exes so boring and lose interest in them or run out of things to talk about? That would never happen with me. I basically beg for him to want me, again, it's what we're taught to do. Option four, I punch him in the face, grab both bottles of wine and go on my way to finish them in the comfort of my living room versus wasting any more time on the damp grass. Option, whatever option's next, because I dropped the page. I stand up and fold up my blanket. Thanks for an interesting conversation. Best of luck finding what you're looking for. I walk myself and my dignity home. I do not do any of these. Instead, Forgive me, viewer, viewer, for I have sinned. I banged him. I know, I know, not with him. Let me remind you, 60 days. Not a handshake, not a hug, not a high five. 60 days. When we enter his building, I pay a bit more, but it's not a bad place to live, eh? When we walked into his apartment. Pretty good setup for someone of my age, don't you think? While I waited him for fi to fix us, waited for him to fix us a drink. Not bad for someone who just moved in, right? When I took off his pants, not my best boxers. I usually wear much nicer ones. Wasn't expecting to get close to someone. After we finished, how was I? Followed by questions asking me to compare him to 
partners of my past, including rating him on his equipment and how he used it. For someone that wasn't interested in marrying me, he sure was seeking my approval. I felt bad for him. As little girls growing up, our parents, teachers, coaches, and role models load us with progressive tools, motivate us to reach beyond the previous limits, inspire us to feel equal, that we can and will succeed, that we will thrive as our male counterparts do. What they failed to mention that the, was that they would be too insecure to date us when we did. Thank you. Thank you, as always, Danny. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> our next reader is Willie Kotiuka. Uh, after completing a career spanning four decades in over 25 countries, Willie decided to go into rehab which is his term for the MFA program to improve his self-taught writing skills. Although he's written many technical reports and seminal papers, most of his writing responded to what clients wanted. Now he writes for his own pleasure. His book project, Reinventing Myself, An Engineer's Life, chronicles his experiences as an engineering consultant advising significant clients. This reading is from the end of chapter 11, Internal Affairs. He describes his experiences with his employer's inquisitors who are trying to pr prove his complicity in unethical practices. Willie. Thank you. The face-to-face -face inquisitions started shortly after that. Everything <clears throat> seemed to happen at the last minute with the inquisitors totally uncoordinated. I only received a couple of days notice to appear at a conference room for a meeting. I never knew ahead of time what to expect. Each invitation included a warning to remind me that as an employee of SNC-Lavalin, I had to fully cooperate and not tell anyone anything about my meeting. All discussions had to remain confidential Apparently they were doing fact checking. And so what happened in the inquisition room had to stay in the inquisition room. They recorded all the proceedings, even though I was not allowed to take notes. At first I found the meetings with the inquisitors were interesting. However, after a few meetings, I started getting physically sick at the thought of meeting with them. The tone during the sessions had changed over time. I felt they were determined to prove my guilt. They never let me know the subject of the meeting I arrived, until I arrived at, in the room. They asked me probing questions, carefully noting my responses, and with each question, trying to get me to stumble on my recollections. When there was nothing more to say about a subject, they would pull out copies of emails I had long ago deleted and ask me to read them. One senior inquisitor was surprised when everything I said aligned perfectly with the contents of the email. You should have seen his face. There was never a discrepancy between my recollections and the emails they extracted from the archives. Maybe it was just a strategy to wear me down. Well, their strategy was working. With each session, their assumption I was guilty affected me physically, to the point I was taking two sick days to return back to normal. At the corporate level, the company promoted well being and health, yet I felt they were undermining my health. This bullying was fully sanctioned at the highest level. The CEO gave his explicit instructions to find and punish the guilty. They kept on quoting extracts from the official ethics guide. When I finally reread the official ethics policy, I discovered they violated the ethics guide on at least three significant points. Assumption of guilt, bullying, and fairness. On the first point, the guide states that there should be no assumption of guilt. The inquisitors repeatedly assumed I was guilty. On the second point, it says that bullying would never be tolerated within the company. Yet they kept on pressuring me to incriminate myself when I was not guilty. 
On the third point, fair treatment for everyone, I was not treated fairly. After 22 meetings over 18 months, I finally had enough. I could not take more of this harassment. I wrote directly to the head of compliance, complaining about the treatment of me. Silence. I received no reply. Finally, I accused the company of violating its, violating its own ethics policy, this time carefully copying selected people within the company. Although the chief compliance officer still refused to meet with me, he sent me some of his senior inquisitors to meet me. They were much more conciliatory this time. Maybe it was because I controlled the agenda. It was the 22nd and last meeting I ever had with them. I decided to use my vacation days and I resigned when my vacation credits ran out on November 1st, 2018. While I had enough information to build a solid case against the company, I chose not to. I wanted to enjoy my retirement and not waste any more time being miserable with unfair accusatory bullies. Until the inquisition started, my career was better than I could have ever imagined. I preferred to leave quietly and remember the positive experiences. After all, over the 35 years with the company, they are the ones who shaped me most. Thank you. Thank you, Willie. I'm glad that you decided to do your rehab with us. Uh, thank you very much. And I look forward to, to the book that comes out of this. Our final reader tonight is ML Breen. She is a Toronto writer, editor, and photojournalist who's worked at the Globe and Mail, the Toronto Sun, McLean Hunter, and the Toronto Star, where she was an editor at the news desk for 20 years. While at the Star, she began her popular nature column, Wild in the City. She continues to write about nature for the Star while editing for the paper remotely. She holds a BSc in zoology, an MSc in pharmacology, did PhD studies in medical biophysics, and will soon Hopefully, she says, hold an MFA from the University of King's College. I can pretty well guarantee that. Margaret. You have to unmute. <laughs> Learn, you think I There didn't. we are. Uh, I just want to make sure everybody can A, see, and hear me. I know I'm kind of far away from the... Okay, the... the okay, great, thank you. So my book is called Swan Songs. But the piece I'm reading today is called A Dress for the Mother of the Groom. And it, it, I, what I did was I took sections out of my book and put them together into this sort of sub story about looking for a dress for my son's wedding in the summer of 2019. And it, my entries are done as sort of diary journal entries. So this one is called Monday, March the 25th, 2019. It's a glorious sunny day, and I'm heading out for the afternoon with a pal who has offered to help me find a mother of the groom dress for the upcoming June 21st wedding of my son Jake and his fiancée Liz. My friend is taking me to one of her favorite dress shops, which happens to be in Oakville, way out of my stomping grounds in downtown Toronto. We're having lunch first in a waterside restaurant she likes. The number of times I have gone shopping for a dress with a friend is exactly zero. I am no fan of dresses. They're uncomfortable, and except in midsummer, they require some kind of garment our mothers used to call hose, as well as appropriate shoes. I'm allergic to both, but I've agreed to go along with my friend mostly because I like her company, and I trust her taste. She's a professional woman who must meet the public every day looking polished. I've told her that looking for this elusive mother of the groom dress which must be carefully calibrated along a variety of sensitive lines having to do with the bride and her mother is a prospect that fills me with dread. I'd rather walk through a field of spiders than buy a new dress right now. Since leaving the newspaper where I spent the last 20 years of my journalism career and where the sartorial standards were more, shall we say, stevedore than senior executive, there hasn't been much need for me to dress well. 
Now, in semi-retirement, I've been living around the clock in bulky, shapeless clothes. My daily uniform consists of tattered jeans that may or may not have been new when Jean Chrétien was prime minister, and a sweatshirt of similar vintage. Underneath all that is a navy cotton turtleneck from an L.L. Bean that I wore when my late brother Ken took me skiing when I was a young teenager. That shirt must be more than 50 years old, I realized with horror. But it's so comfy, I think, and put it on again. As part of my daily routine, I go bird watching at Ashbridge's Bay, my local park on Toronto's Lake Ontario waterfront. Every bit of clothing I wear for this activity is some version of gray, black, or dark blue. These are the colors of a person who would rather be a backyard junko than a cardinal. I am all right with being a schlumpadinka, what Oprah calls people who would just rather not think about their attire. Tan France, the Queer Eye Cruise fashion guru, would pop a button of his bespoke shirt if he saw me in my birding clothes. Perhaps I should have given my friend's invitation more thought. There is more than a likelihood that this search for a mother of the gown dress thing might not go smoothly. I have to. Once at the fancy dress shop, my pal and the sales clerk find me some garments they insist I must try on. The first is a deeply pleated hot pink shirtwaist with large crystal buttons, approximately the same size as small teacups. In the mirror, I see a pale white haired woman in a dress so pink, it's practically fluorescing like a highlighter pin. A giant floppy bow of the same lurid color ties around the middle and a large poofy stand up collar make it looks like a stiff breeze would take this poor woman away. She looks pained, her face deeply lined as if she just had to inform a loved one of a death in the family. Could this possibly be me? I hate this dress, maybe more than any garment I have ever tried on. Next up is a short and shiny royal blue cocktail dress with a scallop neckline that I refuse to put on. I don't know why, it's just hateful. Instead, I opt to try the safer full length black one. It has short and fluttery see-through sleeves and a high round neck, and it is embellished top to bottom in bits of leaf shaped fabric dotted with sequins. Now the woman in the mirror is the doppelganger of Morticia Adams from the Adams family. She's apparently already attending the funeral of the aforementioned fa dead family member. It's official. The mother of the groom dress excursion is not going well. The sooner I get out of this shop, the better. I thank the store clerk for her patience and time and my friend for the same. Heading home, I realize I'm going to have to drink my wardrobe choices for Jake and Liz's wedding. Something more casual is needed. Something, say, that might look fetching with my chili hat. After all, Jake and Liz are getting married in a forest. Thank you. Sorry, thank you, Mark. <laughs> and, and thank you to all of our wonderful readers tonight. You will now understand what I meant when I said at the beginning of this evening uh, that I am very lucky uh, to be the cohort director for the class of 2021, uh, a great group. The applause uh, might be virtual tonight, uh, but it is heartfelt and well-earned. Uh, thank you all again. So that concludes our program for tonight. If you'd like to know more about our MFA program, please visit the King's website or feel free to email me at Stephen, at Stephen with a PH, uh, dot Kimber at ukings.ca. Once again, thank you all and good night. <laughs>